So recently, for whatever reason, I've been watching a lot of flat earth videos. Um, and in most of the videos, uh, the guy either goes on some crazy conspiracy rant about the government um, and how they control everything and NASA and how they're evil and that's the cause of why um, they don't believe that the earth is a globe and they have all these crazy experiments and it's it's incredibly easy to debunk them they basically don't make any sense um, and it's, it's like talking to a crazy person um, so I came across this video the other day um, and I mean there's a lot of the same sorts of things in this video so this guy talks um, from a position of authority on a lot of topics that it's patently clear that he doesn't understand anything about. The difference between this video and a lot of other videos is that this guy is clearly quite good at talking um, but the things that he's saying um, are very nonsensical. Um, he appears intelligent while if you actually listen to the things it's saying and look at the things that he's saying they don't make any sense um, and he, of course since we all know that the earth isn't flat it's easily provable there's so much evidence out there he's going to have to come from a, a position of um, a position of a false basis of reality to even postulate this so we all know that so he's going to have to completely um, warp uh, his vision of reality to fit his narrative to even make sense. So we know that. But the interesting thing about this podcast is that they give this Flat Earth guy a lot of time to kind of express his views. Um, he's I'm not going to knock this guy. He's very good at talking. Um, and the guy that they've picked... Um, who they say is an astrophysicist. So this video is titled Flat Earther vs. Astrophysicist. Um, it's actually a bit of a lie, so I don't want to knock the guy because it seems like he's a bit out of his element here. But they found some random um, postdoc particle physicist who astrophysics is definitely not his area of expertise. Uh, and the kind of circular logic that this uh, flat earth guy is throwing at him he, he can't really deal with it so there's a couple of problems one English isn't his native language so he can't eloquently explain things as well as the flat earth guy who English is his native language um, he's not prepared for this kind of complete lack of logical thinking so he's he's not used to dealing with that kind of um, that kind of debate and also, it looks like he really doesn't want to be there, and he looks really, really cold throughout the video. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play, um, I'm going to play the introduction from the flat earther, uh, and we can kind of get a feel for his argument, uh, which of course isn't backed up by any evidence. The evidence that he states is that look into it, go out and find it, test it for yourself, see it with your own eyes, and if you actually do go out and do that, you disprove everything that he says. So it's all a complete load. So here. He's done that and he's obviously fudging little things to make the reality fit his worldview, basically. So let's, let's watch his introduction. Well, the, the first most obvious is the complete lack of curvature. Um, no matter how much we try and, and find the pesky curvature, we can't find it, you know. Um, as I said, I, expect, um, I uh, mentioned the curvature calculation which on a 25,000 mile um, circumference should be eight inches per mile squared. That's the amount of drop that you should experience. So um, armed with that calculation, you can go out and, and you know, if you have a, uh, a landmark, uh, a known distance away, preferably over the, over the sea, because obviously there's nothing in the way, um, you, you can do sighting experiments to see how much you're supposed to be able, you know, you're supposed to, be able to see. And uh, I guarantee you, you'll see much more than you're, you know, you're supposed to be able to see. Um, so between that and uh, and the gyroscope, that's that's my my pet one. Um, the gyroscope has a property called uh, rigidity in space. That means once it's set spinning, 
um, it will stay in its orientation no matter what you do with it, regardless of, of gravity, regardless of where it is on Earth, it will stay in its uh, original orientation, you know, re and, you know according to space. So, um, so you get aircraft have uh, a, a gyroscope. They, they always have a mechanical backup gyroscope uh, in, uh, in their artificial horizon. So how it works, very, very simply, is uh, before the plane takes off, they, you know, they're on a level surface, they spin it up, so it gives you the true reference to the ground. So once that reference to the ground is set, then they always know where the horizon is, even through thick cloud. It's not because, you know, as the, as the plane sort of does its um, maneuvers, yeah, the gyroscope will stay in its original orientation. Mm. Fundamental principle um, of, you know, of, uh, of gyroscopics. Um, so, uh, if a plane is doing, uh, say, 4,000 uh, 4, mile trip, um, I think that's, uh, that's something like 90 degrees. Maybe it's, it might be, I can't remember, but it's probably about 90 degrees, um, or 60 degrees, I think it is, of arc that it will make uh, over the, uh, the round Earth. So the, um, so the artificial horizon should start to roll backwards during straight and level flight, but it doesn't. You know, it tells you that uh, you know, the, a plane is flying over a plane. Mm -hmm. um, now people have uh, said that, oh, gyroscopes have, have uh, you know, these things called pendulous veins which, uh, which correct for the, uh, for the curvature. But when you actually look into what these pendulous veins are there for, it's to, to stop the other um, property of a gyroscope, which is called precession. Um, and uh, precession can be induced mechanically um, by sort of, uh, if it's a vacuum system, by uneven air or, um, or particles of dirt in the air. Um. This is the basic crux of his argument. He, he goes on to discuss other things as the conversation evolves, but his main two things from his introduction are the curvature of the Earth is wrong, and he says that there's some experiments that you can do um, that prove that there's no curvature of the Earth, which obviously is false, because you can quite simply tell that there's a curvature of Earth. There's loads of experiments you can do that prove there's a curvature of Earth, and we'll go on to that a bit later. And his other argument is to do with gyroscopics. We can talk about that now. So he goes quite into detail about gyroscopics. So I've paused it there. He goes into even more detail. Um, it's clear he's looked, because this is his pet thing that he goes to, he's uh, looked into all the buzzwords, all the names, um, and he's probably, I imagine he's looked into it through the lens of uh, some kind of flat earth website um, that picks out these key examples that someone's found. Um, I highly doubt he's actually looked into how gyroscopics work and how the artificial horizon works. So, I don't claim to be any kind of expert on gyroscopics. Um, I don't claim to be any kind of expert on how artificial horizons work in planes. Um, I've looked it up very, very briefly today. Um, and he's trying to... Exp his entire point um, that he's trying to make that disproves... The globe is that if you continue flying straight as the artificial horizon, um, if you follow the artificial horizon and keep flying straight, you should fly off the Earth, basically, because because of this rigid motion, when you set a gyroscopic, it's set to that level, um, and then inside a plane, it's got some kind of vacuum or something that keeps it spinning. Um, from what I can tell, that keeps it on this exact same plane, and if you follow that. Logically, if you've got a, 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 a globe, you're going to fly off the globe. You're not going to keep flying around it like planes do. And that's a, obviously that's a fair argument if you don't understand how artificial horizons work. So you can go on YouTube and you can find uh, videos of... So I found one very, very simply um, that shows uh, a horizon. An artificial, someone's got an artificial horizon from an airplane here. And what they do is they set it to default by some level so they set it off by some level 
you can see and then they leave it and they wait and what will happen is it will automatically adjust itself over time to meet the actual level of the earth so it's got something inside it that re reorients itself to the actual horizon I, I assume it uses gravity to do that it will have something that will reorient itself to the horizon. You can look at these videos and you can see if you leave it alone it orients itself back. No matter where you set it it continually over time reorients itself to the actual horizon of Earth. And that's why because you're going around the curve it's always adjusting slightly for the curve of the Earth. So it's very very easily provable to be false. And that's one of his key uh, arguments, one of his pet things that he always goes to. Um, and it's easily, without even understanding exactly how an artificial horizon works and how it readjusts, um, you can do an experiment and you can see that that claim is false. So the next claim, and this is a common claim among uh, flat earthers from what I've seen, is that they seem to get stuck on the images of the globe on the internet. And they tend to pick cherry pick certain examples of these images back from like the 60s and the 70s um, and they say that they were computer generated or photoshopped or whatever they say that they weren't real and then they say that there's no two images of the earth that look the same um, so let's let's listen to what he says about this right well the first and most obvious question is why does every single um, photograph of the earth look different if you put them all together and look at them, every single one looks different. The answer, the answer to that, is with uh, with the uh, a guy called Rob Simon, who actually works for NASA. Okay, um, and his job, as he describes it, and you can find this on YouTube, um, is is creating images from data. Yeah, so they get supposedly they get he gets a load of data, and he creates a a, a a picture of, of Earth from so yeah so as you can see what he's done is he's cherry-picked one particular guy that works for one particular organization that happens to create pictures of the globe from data so this could be for any number of reasons he probably does it for simulation reasons for like weather and things like that um, so he's picked a very very narrow uh, band that happens to satisfy his world view and he's extrapolated that out to every single image so he makes some very very starking claims that for whatever reason don't get picked up on and instantly questioned um, he says there aren't any images of the earth that look the same I mean if you pick a single source like there must be numerous space agencies that have satellites out there, there's people on the ISS, there's all sorts of things that are taking pictures of the Earth at all times throughout the, the day. And you can see the images of the Earth um, changing throughout the time, and they all look the same. Um, if you pick a different one, they're probably using a different camera, they're probably a completely different elevation from the Earth. Um, so many different variables involved and that's they're not gonna look the same I mean if you have let's pick like a, a famous object like the Taj Mahal for example um, look at Instagram pictures of the Taj Mahal none of them are gonna look the same so there's loads of different variables involved and that's that is in no way a, uh, disproving the fact that the Earth is round, which is what he's trying to do. There's there's no logical connection between the fact that images happen to look different and the fact that the Earth isn't round. It just it make, it makes literally no sense. So again, this is another common thing that flat earthers um, like to point to, and this is uh, the fact that when you look at a globe um, in different orientations, the countries look different sizes. So let's see what he has to say about this. Yeah, there's, uh, we've got multiple pictures of the United States, for instance, where, um, you know, they're, they're different sizes on the Earth. Yeah, we've got things like pictures of, of, um, of Australia, yeah, from daytime and nighttime with exactly the same cloud formations above, above it. 
Okay, so he goes on to talk about photoshopping images and copying clouds and things like that. Um, I mean, the different size thing is extremely easy. So if, if I just get like a, a 3D image of the globe, for example, um, and we look at Africa here, this is in one orientation. If I move the globe up to here, oh look, Africa looks completely different shape because we've distorted the view of the globe. Oh look, if we move it over here, Africa again looks completely different shape. Go down here, Africa looks a completely different shape. Like, that perfectly follows um, our understanding of physics. So, again, um, he's doing a very, very um, disingenuous thing of, because he doesn't understand uh, physics, he doesn't understand the way things work, he attributes that misunderstanding to the fact that everything's false. Um, when in actual fact, his misunderstanding perfectly fits our understanding of physics. I mean, I can show you how, I mean, if I rotate the globe a little bit, look, Africa's a different angle now. Let's rotate it a bit more. Oh, look, Africa's on sideways now. It's the same country, but it looks completely different. So it's a completely uh, absurd uh, contention. So, another thing that flat earthers do is they attribute everything to some kind of NASA conspiracy, and it's always um, NASA. They always hark back to NASA, even though NASA obviously isn't the only space agency. Um, everything always goes back to NASA. So let's see what he has to say. So every other image, including the blue marble, which is just a photograph, it's not a simulation. It was just there to create a photograph, supposedly. Yeah, every other image that NASA puts out is CGI. Yeah, but it's not only about NASA, right? Well, so I mean, he makes a good he he makes a few good points throughout this argument, but for the majority, the reason I'm cutting him out of a lot of these is because he takes a long time. He's stunned by the ignorance of this person. He's stunned by his complete lack of understanding of the world around us. That he he can't argue he's just like I can't believe what this guy's saying like I can't believe the words are coming out of this guy's mouth but occasionally he does make good points like this so he says some ridiculous things he says that every image that NASA puts out is CGI so that's obviously fake they put loads and loads and loads of images out that are real um, but I mean it's this dogmatic um, mistrust of the government and mistrust of NASA that leads them down these dark alleys. Okay, so now we move back to his first point is that the Earth isn't curved uh, and he says very uh, blatantly in his opening speech that we haven't been able to prove that the Earth is curved. It's the one thing that's eluded us. We haven't proved it when obviously there is so much proof. Um, there's so many different experiments you can do. There's there's overwhelming evidence that uh, there's a curvature in Earth. I mean, there's systems that we rely on on a daily basis that are contingent on the fact that there is a curve in the Earth. They wouldn't work if we didn't assume that there was a curve in the Earth. So it's obviously ridiculous. So, but um, in this case, uh, our physicist, Pierre, he makes a good argument um, and we'll see if we, if we go, all go to the i360 and then climb on top of the you know take the, the big ride and you know go on top of it why can't we see the Eiffel Tower because you know we can only see a certain distance we've got atmospheric effects that mean you can't see you know uh, if if you live in California no, but okay uh, let's well, just let say me like just give you an example if you live in California yeah um, you get the weather report in the morning you get as, as along with a weather report, visibility, 10 miles, yeah? It's not because of curvature or anything, it's because the atmospherics limit the li distance you can actually see. Yeah, but you could design some experiment where you have a laser and you sh shine it from the Eiffel Tower and you could have telecommunication like this, boom, you don't need to have satellites. Well, you don't need to have satellites because, again, we, we have line of sight communications which, again, should be um, hidden by the curvature. Okay, so... Okay. 
So he makes a very valid point. If the Earth is flat, there's no curvature, there's nothing blocking line of sight, um, we should be able to set up a test with lasers that means that we could shoot a laser to the Eiffel Tower and the Eiffel Tower could shoot a laser back for us. We should be able to set up that kind of experiment. And if uh, our flat earther person wants to disprove the curve of the Earth, he should be able to set up that experiment, but obviously he's never going to be able to set it. I and mean, then you should be able to set up some kind of experiment in some way, like not necessarily there because there might be things blocking it that he could use as an excuse. There will be some point where you could prove that there's nothing blocking the way between that point and the Eiffel Tower, and you should be able to shoot a laser between the two. But obviously you're not going to be able to because it's being blocked by the curve of the Earth. So if you set up an experiment like that, you would easily disprove the flat Earth theory. And then at the end of this, he goes, he completely sidetracks this issue, which of course disproves his point, so he's not going to touch on it. And he goes on a rant about how line of sight communications work, and so we don't need satellites. Um, and I have quite a lot to say about this. So. There are line of sight communications, there's Wi-Fi that you can get, and he talks about Wi-Fi. Um, these Wi-Fi towers only work at very short distances. And the reason they only work at very short distances, and he could look this up if he wanted to, is because of the curvature of the Earth. Some cities have Wi-Fi where you have a satellite, and there's a big broadcast tower in the city. It has to be close to the city because it's only got a limited distance. And they can broadcast Wi-Fi via satellite. That is a possibility that you can get in some cities. It's quite spotty because any kind of interference in the way of like birds and anything getting in the way of the signal will affect your Wi-Fi signal. So it's not great, but it is a possibility that you can get. Um, on the point of satellites, there's so many things that you can do with satellites. You can see satellites with a telescope. So there's a website you can go on that gives you the geo coordinates of all public satellites and what you can do is you can go out you can buy a telescope most telescopes now have tracking in them so you put in a coordinate uh, you can even put in like a coordinate stream on some of them and the 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 telescope will automatically move to that coordinate so do it with a GPS satellite for example because they're they're always broadcasting their position so you may need to adjust it for the time lag but you can set your telescope to point directly at that satellite and then you can see a satellite for yourself you can see that they exist with your own eyes he obviously hasn't done that if he goes and does that he will see that there's a satellite in the air even more than that um, you can see the International Space Station as long as it's flying overhead and there's a, there's a website you can go on to track the exact location of the ISS wait for it to track a path where it goes over your location and provided there's no clouds and it's a clear day, you will be able to see the ISS. If you put enough effort in it, it may take a few weeks, may take a few months for you to get the exact conditions, but you can set yourself up for an experiment. If this matters so much to you, you can set yourself up for an experiment where you could see the ISS with the naked eye. You don't even need a telescope. You could even just get a hand binoculars or like a hand telescope or something, and you could see the ISS clearly, plain as day. It's, it's, it's crazy. GPS is reliant on the fact that there are satellites in the air um, and that we're on a globe for the whole GPS system to work. It wouldn't work if those two things didn't exist. And then what, what each satellite is actually doing is it's broadcasting two things. It's broadcasting its exact location and it's broadcasting its time that it's sent out that broadcast. And what you do is you take the timestamp that it gives you and you take the timestamp of when you received it and they're going to be different by a couple of microseconds because of the time it takes the, the signal to get from the satellite to you. And then you can calculate the distance. So you know its exact position and you know its distance. So you can draw a sphere around it and that gives you a point of reference. You are somewhere on that sphere, essentially. And then what you do is you look at another satellite. So you get 
signals from as many satellites as you can. You record them all, and you can draw. You can use the exact same method to draw spheres around them. If you've got four satellites, then you can use it in such a way that the spheres overlap in only one position, and that position will be your exact GPS location on the globe. So that's how GPS systems work, basically. Um, you can do some research into it, you can look into how the exact mathematics of these work. It's similar to triangulation on a plane, but it's with a 3D you need four uh, spheres essentially to pinpoint your location exactly. So yeah, so that I would recommend, he could do that experiment and then he could prove to himself that GPS works. And GPS only works if satellites exist and we're on a globe. So that's something he could do, which obviously he hasn't done and obviously he won't do because it disproves him. So going back to the topic of Wi-Fi signals and blocking line of sight and things like that, um, well, let's see what the Flat Earther guy has to say on that topic. Uh, Wi-Fi signal, cool. Sorry, they were, they were beaming a Wi-Fi signal from one, one station to another. There's a frog down there. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, beaming your Wi-Fi signal from, from one station to another one 50 miles away, mm. right? The curvature should have blocked that signal. It's line, Wi-Fi, line of sight, yeah? Well, it depends on which height did this... Radio, it's radio, <laughs> it's line of sight. It can't go through the earth. Yeah. No, but it depends on... So, this makes no sense, obviously. So, obviously, what Pierre's saying... Um, when you're doing line of sight so let's use the earth curve calculator which like googling it the first one that I picked I assume it's the one that um, Dave's used so let's use it you can clearly see on the calculator it depends on the height like he's saying it's line of sight it's it's blocked by the horizon or whatever but even by his own calculator, like it depends on the height of the two objects as to whether it will be blocked or not. And that's what all Pierre's saying, and it's obviously true, and you can see that on his calculator. So like they say a distance of fifty miles. So like if we plug in something like we can plug in whatever the height of number one is. Yeah. Let's say five hundred feet. Um so I've already done that, yeah, so let's plug in five hundred feet, fifty mile distance. So the horizon will be at 27 miles away and our the height of our target one would need to be 341 feet for there to be direct line of sight between the two. So he can use his own calculator, maybe he doesn't understand what these parameters actually mean, which is very likely, but he can use a calculator to see that line of sight wouldn't be blocked over 50 miles. And you can do this over like absurd miles. You can do it over a hundred miles, really. So obviously this is going to need to be absurdly high. But let's about try and balance them a little bit. Okay. Okay. So we've got two objects. They're obviously very very tall, and we can go a hundred miles distance, which is huge. Um, so one of our objects is. 1500 feet high, one of our other objects is 1843 feet high. Um, and then the line of sight is not going to be blocked by the horizon. I mean, we can take a margin of error, we can increase these by another 100 200 feet each um, to account for the fact that there's probably going to be stuff in the way. Um, and like water level, like sea levels are going to change and things like that, it's going to affect it to make sure that we're not blocking. We probably want to give ourselves some leeway on not blocking the line of sight. But it's perfectly possible on a globe to not block line of sight over distances far further than what he's saying is impossible. So his argument doesn't make any sense and he's trying to escape out of it um, by saying nonsense things, essentially. So the next segment is quite frustrating. Um, the Dave is using very disingenuous debating tactics to try and push his point. Um, so in this section he tries to use this curvature argument to say that we shouldn't be able to see 
the White Cliffs of Dover, basically. He uses this Earth curve calculator that I've just used to try and disprove the fact that the Earth is curved, basically. He's saying that on a flat Earth, you can see the Cliffs of Dover using his calculations and things on a curved Earth. You can't see the calculator. Um, so let's, let's just see. Count. Okay. I've got pictures of the White Cliffs of Dover from, um, from uh, Calais. Or Boulogne, I can't remember. Boulogne, I think it is. Yeah, it's uh, 31 miles away from the White Cliffs of Dover. Yeah, the eye height is 30 feet. Yeah, that's where the picture was taken. And with the Earth Please. calculator, so let's put this into the Earth calculator. So what was it? 31 miles and 30 feet. So eye height 30 feet, target distance 31 miles. So he's getting this. Um, the amount hidden is 395 feet, so okay. So let's look at the height of the White Cliffs of Dover. The White Cliffs of Dover are 350 feet. So, so this is his argument: is that essentially we're starting off at 30 feet. White Cliffs of Dover are 31 miles away and the White Cliffs of Dover are 350 feet so they should be covered up. Pierre's point is that essentially there's too many variables, uh, the calculations are too messy, there's too much error bounds um, to get an approximation so how, how do we know, how does he know that the eye height of the video of the picture that he's seen is exactly 30 feet? How does he know that the distance between the two photos is exactly 31 miles. I mean, if we change some of these parameters a little bit, maybe it's not 50 feet. Maybe it's maybe it's 50 feet, for example. Maybe the distance isn't 31 miles. Maybe the distance is actually 28.7 miles or something. We change it, then now we suddenly we can see some of the the white cliffs of Dover. Maybe, maybe he's actually on a cliff. Most of the photos that I've seen, he's on a cliff that looks like it's way over 100 feet up. Let's calculate that. Oh look, now we can see most of the White Cliffs of Dover. Like, if I look up uh, distance from Calais to White Cliffs of Dover, the distance it gives is the distance um, from the cliffs to uh, the point in France where most photos are taken and most people is 20.7 20, 20 miles. So you can see, like, if we're 100 feet up, because if you go on a cliff, and let's say you move back, I don't know, 21.7 miles, for example, let's say it's a mile back and you go up like a 150 foot cliff, oh, suddenly you can see nearly the entirety of the work, only 30 feet of the White Cliffs of Dover are blocked, like the bottom bit, which is what the photos look like. So it's a very disingenuous argument, essentially. It doesn't disprove anything, really. He, he's he got no evidence. Like, everything fits the model that we're using. He's just cherry-picking some examples that are wrong. He's putting in wrong parameters into a calculator and getting out a result that fits his argument. So it's bullshit. So they actually have an argument uh, around this, obviously, because it doesn't make any sense. Um, and I'm not going to include most of that in the video, but it's just a few key points. So this is one key point. Calculation right, wrong. I'm saying the error estimation is wrong. But there's no error in it. It's a ca it's well, a, that's the problem. It's a calculation. That's not scientific, then. It's a cir <laughs> we, know, we know how to calculate a circle. Yeah. No, no, I know how to calculate. So again, He's misunderstanding the point that Pierre's making, and he's trying to say uh, there's no error in it. It's a calculation. Um, that statement just does not make any sense. So of course there's errors. The errors that he's talking about are what I've just shown. The errors are in the values that you're putting into the calculation. Like you said, you based it on a photo. Like unless you took the photo or unless you're there. Even if you are there, like, how do you know the exact height that you are above sea level? Uh, another thing that they go into is about sea level. Let's show a few clips about sea level. 
You do the calculations. You you go you know, to sea level because I said most sea level. But you know you have tides. What do you actually no, stand sorry, on the beach? Sea is level, no matter where it is. Yeah, the sea. <laughs> that's why it's called sea level. Yeah. <laughs> so again, what? Let's let's watch another one about sea level. Curve so your eye height is in between zero and three and a half meter. It's because you have waves and you can't measure exactly where you're standing on the beach, exactly like where is the actual sea level. The actual sea level is where the water is. Water, you have waves, right? Water finds its own level. Are you saying that uh, no, I can't I'm measure? I can't I'm measure it. I'm just saying that you know, if you go. What, so Pierre's making a good point, but as usual, he's not explaining it uh, in a good enough fashion. He's getting he's getting out debated by this guy. Basically, this guy's a good debater, but he's coming off faulty logic. So what Pierre's saying is what I've said basically is that there's too many errors. You can't know um, exactly where you're standing in the photo. Like you can't tell that exactly. Um, and another thing, which is a key thing, is that because our horizon is water, we need to know the exact level that the sea is at. And he makes some crazy, like, the, the, it's it's where the water is, but he makes a point earlier about tides, which is completely written off. The water level changes. Surely, surely Dave's heard of tides. Surely Dave can go to a sea, stand there for a couple of hours, and notice that the water level's gone up and down by a couple of metres. So his argument of sea is level, water makes its own level. Um, yeah, water does make its own level, but it changes throughout the day. That's what tides are. So your calculations are going to differ by a margin of whatever the tide changes up and down. So the tide, the water level goes up by, I don't know, three, four meters in the tidal change. That's going to affect your calculation. Um, so that all needs to be taken into account for when you're putting the values into the calculation it needs to be taken into account for otherwise your results aren't going to mean anything um, and that's a fundamental thing um, that Dave is either not understanding or he's purposely misunderstanding to push his agenda and this is one more clip that I thought was quite funny to include on, the, on this topic but, yeah, I mean, but I, as I said, we can go out. You can go out, and we're, we're, you know, unless you want to do the the scientific thing and fudge the figures, yeah, add in a a constant, yeah, <laughs> which which uh, you know scientists want to do. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> unless you want to go in and do the scientific thing and add a constant, like what? The equation that he's using. Is, unless, he hasn't come up with the equation himself. He says he's gone onto a website and he's using an equation. So someone's come up with that equation. Someone's done the science and created the equation. So he's using that as his argument. So how does that make any sense? He's not doing it himself. He's not doing the experiment himself. He's using a scientific equation that someone's come up with to fudging it himself, as I've just shown, to prove his point. So it's... It's unbelievable, and someone should be able to just call him out on that instantly. Like, Pierre's obviously not prepared, so he can't just call him out on that, like I'm doing now. But it's it's obvious. It's completely obvious, and it's absurd. So this clip highlights another issue with the the logic of flat earthers, and their logic is that they only believe things that come from their own senses basically. They only believe things that they can see, that they can feel, so they don't put trust in instruments basically. Um, so that's what this clip will highlight. Uh, saying that, uh, you know, um, why is the earth um, flat and everything else in the sky um, round, yeah? Now um, Pierre said that, um, that you know, you look, you look through the telescope and you've seen um, spherical objects up there, yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, mm, that, that's where I've got a problem because, you know, it takes two eyes to, to render 3D, yeah? So if you're looking at something through a telescope, you can only see it in 2D. It's a blob of light. It's not, it's not spherical at all. If you see anything spherical with one eye, 
right? You're making that up. So, okay. Why, why would... So he's going on the assumption that we're using, like, the classic Galileo one-eye telescope like that, and we're looking at all of that. So he doesn't understand what a telescope is first. Um, another thing is that telescopes render 3D images, like... Okay, it's a 2D image that appears on the screen, but it's a 3D image that's coming, it's 3D data that's coming into the telescope, essentially. So, scientists don't look through telescopes with their own eyes. They, the telescopes go out and scan, and then it's just data that appears on a screen that they then analyze. So, telescopes are looking at the sky, and they're analyzing unbelievable amounts of data, like petabytes and petabytes of data. Um, that they're downloading constantly. So scientists will then go through that data and see if there's any observations. And a lot of it's automated now. A lot of telescopes just automated and they've got an algorithm that can detect new star systems. It's very advanced. So they, they know what they're looking for basically and they have an out because there's way too much data to, for a person to process. So it's all done automatically. It's not like there's one guy just there looking up at the sky and going, Oh, I'm only looking at it through one eye, so I can't visualize this in 3D. So the things out there aren't 3D. It's it's an absurd, absurd um, postulation based off of a faulty understanding of what telescopes actually are and how they're used. So in this section, um, he goes on to kind of talk about the different models of uh, gravity. Um, the Newtonian and Einstein models, uh, so let's see. Towards, it'd be harder and harder to get to the poles, for example. Okay. That's but that's, that's only, um, you know, according to a theory of gravity. Which theory are you talking about? Because it sounds very much like Newtonian to me. Yeah. Right, well, this is well New Newton has been proved to be absolutely, completely wrong. Right? Just so I, I have a lot of issue with this. Like... I don't know why Dave talks in absolute certainties about things that are wrong. He's wrong, for example. So, okay, so... So he talked about Newton's theory. And he said that there's a theory of gravity. So, this is a very, very common thing that people do. And it's a misunderstanding of the word theory. So, a theory isn't something that's just made up and pulled out of thin air. Like, that's not how theory is used in scientific... Um, nomenclature like in general speech we say something's a theory when it's just made up it's something that we're going through that we're considering in science a theory is something that when it gets to the theory stage it has to have been proven peer reviewed it has to go through series and series of people trying to disprove it until it gets to the stage where it's a theory so we've got the theory this is very commonly used with evolution for example we've got the theory of evolution now, evolution has been proven to such a degree that it's one of the most proven things in science, essentially. And that's the theory. Gravity, again, is a theory. Like, we know that gravity exists. We can measure it. Um, it fits into pretty much our understanding of pretty much every model of the universe. has gravity in there somewhere. So, to say that gravity is a theory, so therefore it doesn't exist, just means that you don't understand what theory means. And his point about Einstein's theories disproving Newton's models, uh, they don't disprove them. They, like, you can adjust Newton's models and Newton's calculations to fit on top of Einstein's models exactly. So it doesn't, it's just a different way of looking at things, basically, and a more complete way of looking at things that unifies a lot of different things in science. So it doesn't disprove Newton's theories. Like, you can't disprove Newton's theories because you can you can show that gravity has this set ex acceleration. You can use all of Newton's theories and you can prove that they're true. So Einstein is just a next level on top of that. It doesn't disprove it. It encapsulates it and it explains further things that Newton's theory doesn't explain. There's a difference between disproving and showing capturing more information about things that we know and that's what Einstein's theory does 
So Newton's theory breaks down, for example, when you get into the extremes like black holes and things like that. Um, but Newton's theory, like they didn't even know what black holes were back then, so Newton's theory wasn't designed to capture that. So it doesn't disprove it, it's just like an evolution of the models that we have basically, and that happens in science all the time. And that's part of why science is so great. Okay, so in this clip he tries to say that there's no evidence for gravity. We don't see any evidence of gravity, yeah? Gravity is supposedly a weak force, I yeah? The weakest out of all the fundamental forces, apparently, yeah, overcome by magnetism. So, and the, the sorry, overcome by magnetism. W but what does that well, mean? The so again, he's. <sighs> it's very, very. I can see why Pierre's struggling quite a lot. It's exhausting. It's very difficult to debate someone when they're coming from a position of complete ignorance on everything essentially you almost get to the level which we're going to get to a little bit later where you start debating on the meanings of words and that's when it, everything just goes if they're completely redefining what words mean then there's no chat you could you have no platform on which to debate on so he says we have we don't see any evidence of gravity which is untrue there's if he actually looked there's undeniable evidence that gravity exists as a force. He then goes on to say about how gravity is a weak force, it's the weakest force. Yeah? And Pierre's point is, so what? So what if it's a weak force? And then he goes on to say that it's overpowered by magnetism and then he goes on to say that it's overpowered by vacuums. Um, and that's, that somehow disproves gravity because it's overpowered by these two forces. So, okay, so gravity is a weak force, it's true, it's a very, very weak force, but um, we feel gravity's effect uh, here because the Earth is so massive, the Earth is unbelievably massive, the Earth is thousands and thousands of miles across, and that is just overwhelmingly large. So, the Earth is large, the Earth is huge. In comparison to us so that's why we even though gravity is really weak that's why we can feel its effects because the mass of earth is so large that it emits such a gravity that it's pulling thing it's pulling us in and it's pulling our atmosphere in um, and it's also making sure that the moon keeps orbiting us as well it's having an effect on pulling the moon in towards us um, and on that point like Gravity is weak, but you can have things like black holes, which have incredible mass, um, where gravity is unbelievably strong. So it's all relative. Like, so let's say we stood in somewhere close to a black hole or a lot by a giant sun or something. Gravity would then overpower magnetism. Gravity would be the dominant force. Like. It's all relative. He can't understand the concept of relativity, and that really, really impacts his argument. So this is where he starts making statements like um, vacuum is much more powerful than gravity. He starts making statements that you just can't make. Like, it's a pointless statement. Like, in some cases, a vacuum might be stronger than gravity. In other cases, gravity is much stronger than a vacuum. Like... And he also has a fundamental misunderstanding of what the word vacuum means. So let's watch the clip. Right. Okay. Right. So um, a vacuum is much more powerful than gravity. We know that because Mythbusters did a, a show where they used a standard vacuum cleaner to lift a car. Yeah. Just like the magnet lifting lifting paper clips. Yeah. Um, a vacuum cleaner literally lifted a car. You know. That power of that vacuum, only generated by a vacuum cleaner, not the vacuum of space. Yeah. So, okay, so there's so much misunderstanding going on here. He doesn't understand the idea of scale. So, as an object gets bigger, gravity gets bigger. We're on a massive object like Earth, so the gravity is going to be quite strong. But not that strong. So, you can, in theory, design 
like he talks to this Mythbusters video and I've watched it and essentially they use a vacuum cleaner so he's talking about two different types of vacuum but a vacuum cleaner to create a vacuum suction that's powerful enough to lift a car so he's saying that vacuums are stronger than gravity and then he then goes on to um, use that like that claim uh, to then say that since a vacuum cleaner has created this vacuum the vacuum of space is much more powerful than this vacuum cleaner so why doesn't since a vacuum cleaner is more powerful than gravity why doesn't the vacuum of space suck all the atmosphere off off the earth and I mean you're, so you're arguing about two different things that there isn't really a power of vacuum like a, vac a vacuum just means an absence of matter basically when you're creating a vacuum with suction you're sucking all the air out of the um, out of the suction cup and that's creating a pressure differential between the suction cup and the outside space which basically keeps them locked together and that's why you can lift things up it's just you're creating that pressure differential that locks the suction cup to the object and then you need a force like quite a strong force to break that essentially so he's getting he's getting completely misunderstood between why that effect is happening basically but he says that why isn't the atmosphere like no part of the atmosphere is escaping into space so let's 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 see that clip the atmosphere dragged off into space because you know when you, whenever we see a high pressure next to a lower pressure there's movement from high to low always yeah mm -hmm. so we've got a pressurized system the earth right next to an unpressurized system space and no movement from one to the other mm -hmm. right there's no barrier in the way apparently yeah so there should be a movement yeah so he's taking a concept of things moving from high pressure to low pressure to equalize the pressure so he's using that concept to say why doesn't our atmosphere escape um, so for one some of our atmosphere does escape into space like if you look into global warming um, quite a lot of the gases from our atmosphere do escape into space some of them do, some of them do get out. So we do lose things off the earth into space. So we are losing a little bit of uh, nitrogen and our carbon, uh, carbon dioxide. And things are leaking into space. It's not a massive amount, but things are breaking out into space. So it's not true that our atmosphere isn't leaking into space. And the reason why our entire atmosphere doesn't leak into space is because we've got gravity. Gravity, the gravity of earth, is strong enough that it's holding everything in so it's gravity that's why that's why our atmosphere stays in so how do you explain it then how do you explain the reason why so he's set an argument and he's not going to prove why it happens he's just said something so if there's no gravity which is something that he's saying doesn't exist why doesn't the atmosphere just fly off into space then he's got no answer for that he's it's, it's his arguments are circular and he's disproving his own arguments by what he's saying so here this is where he says that there's no gravity so he's saying there's no gravity um, and yet gravity is the reason why the atmosphere is staying to the earth so he doesn't have another explanation as to why the pressure doesn't and it's because of gravity and he's saying that gravity doesn't exist so he's arguing against his own point so let's see I'm saying I'm just trying to, to see what is the actual conclusion okay I'm saying that uh, we don't have gravity we have density and buoyancy an experiment I um, a thought experiment I'll give you here mm -hmm. is imagine if you had um, <laughs> a gas bottle yeah an empty gas bottle <laughs> yeah. and you you weigh it and then zero out that weight so the, the you know the gas bottle um, is is reading zero on the scale yeah no you tar it yeah so you yeah. just zero it out so you you're ignoring the, the weight of the gas bottle and you fill that gas bottle 
with one pound of helium. Okay, mm -hmm. so it'd be filled with liquid helium and you can measure it so it's a, a pound, yeah? Evacuate that helium, that pound of helium, into a balloon. Mm -hmm. Hold the balloon and hold a, a pound weight. If you let go of them, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to fly. Balloon's going to go up, the weight's going to go down. They both weigh a pound. Mm -hmm. They both have, you know, this, this uh, supposed force of gravity. Okay, so he's getting confused between mass and weight. So weight is just Earth's gravity having an effect on the mass. So he's saying a pound of helium and a pound weight. So he's talking about density and things like that. So, okay. So he goes on a big rant about buoyancy and how buoyancy means that there's no gravity. So let's have a look at what buoyancy is. So I'm going to use Wikipedia because I don't know a perfect definition of what buoyancy is. But buoyancy is um, an upward force. So we'll see later that he goes on to use buoyancy to, de to determine what gravity is. Um, so it's an upward force that counteracts gravity. He has a fundamental misunderstanding of some very, very, uh, like, beginner principles of physics. So this is another section where he goes on to try and talk about Einstein's model of uh, curved space-time, uh, and he tries to explain that it, it doesn't make any sense. Einsteinian model, yeah? Einstein, the Einsteinian model is a curvature of space and time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have a, a massive object and it's curving space so that if you try and go past it, space itself is curving towards the, the Earth, say. Mm -hmm. And, you you know, you try and go past it in a straight line, you'll curve towards the Earth. And that's the that's why, you know, you, it's not really a force. It's literally a curvature of space. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. But what actually causes the movement? Yeah. Sorry, what the movement? The movement. No. Um. Einstein's describing a curvature of space that says if you try and go in a straight line past the Earth, you're going to curve into it, yeah? You're, tr you're still going in a straight line, it's just that space itself is actually curved, okay? That's his model, right? No, well, so you're going to be deviated, like, you have to go, you're going to have a deviation from gravity, right? This is no, that's what I'm saying. They, they, they use a, um, an example of having a, uh, uh, you know, a bowling ball in uh, on the middle of a trampoline yeah and if you roll a marble next to it you know in a straight line it the marble starts to curve towards and it ends up sticking to the to the basketball right great but it doesn't tell you what provides the movement okay because because if you put the you know if you're putting a marble next to it and you don't push it you put the marble next to the uh, or near to the the uh, the the bowling ball yeah well, in that model, the, it's actually gravity, you know, the fact that we're on Earth and there's a downwards direction. Okay, so first of all, so it's, he, there's a harm with 100% certainty that he doesn't understand Einstein's models. There's, there's probably very few people on this Earth, like there's probably a hand, like in the tens of thousands of people that, fully understand Einstein's model um, I'm obviously not one of them like I have a rudimentary understanding of the curving of space-time and Einstein's field equations and how he uses um, tensor notation to represent his models and how it, it doesn't use the Cartesian coordinates it, it intrinsically links uh, the coordinates of space and the coordinates of time together how they're intrinsically linked in his equations, so that they're dependent on one another. Um, so time actually has a, an impact on space, and space actually has an impact on time, and they're intrinsically linked in his model. I understand that concept. He doesn't even understand that concept because he's not making any sense. So, so he's used the. There's a very classic example of where you have like a sheet. You put something big in the middle that's meant to represent a big object like the sun. So he thinks it represents the Earth, but 
classically, it could represent the Earth, but usually it represents a massive object like the Sun. And then you roll planets around the outside. So the marbles are meant to represent planets in the solar system. You roll them around, and then they keep circling and circling and circling. And then eventually they crash into the planet. Um, and that's fun. That's fine, but it's a very, very basic representation of, of a solar system. So to explain to children basically it's not going to capture all the different elements that are going on um, and then he's saying what's actually moving it well if you drop it gravity is acting on that object and it's pulling it in towards so there's there's absolutely no there's no it's not acting in contrary to what we experience in real life that would happen in real life if you suddenly drop the planet next to a star without any uh, sideward velocity it would tend towards the planet uh, the star and then it would crash into it and that's exactly what would happen in Einstein's um, Einstein's model so there's no there's no contradiction there so he doesn't really have any point so here again he makes the point that gravity is just a theory which just demonstrates his lack of understanding of what the word theory actually means in the scientific community and then he goes on to say that Einstein's theory doesn't work which clearly it, it does work but that's, that's a it. theory to explain why um, why people can stand on the bottom of a, of a ball and not fall off yeah that's all it is the uh, I'm trying to tell you that these theories don't work yeah the curvature of space-time you know, allows for for moving objects going near something where it's deforming space-time. Yeah, a moving object will go towards it. Yes, fair enough. But if that object isn't moving, there's nothing in in Einstein's model that will will, will account for the actual motive force, the actual thing that causes the object to move. What can I say? He doesn't know Einstein's theories, so how can he say that there's nothing in there that causes the motive force? Of course, he has absolutely no evidence for any of his claims, obviously, because if he did, his claims would actually be true. But obviously, he's just going off uh, what he thinks. He's going off his flawed misunderstanding of theories, and he's postulating that as the common sense way without requiring any evidence. Um, so obviously his arguments make no sense uh, and he makes wild claims like Einstein's theories don't work um, prove it like they've been heavily peered reviewed by the greatest minds of our generation so here he is again talking about buoyancy and density and how that replaces gravity um, and as I've just shown you gravity is a key component in buoyancy um, in any calculation to do with buoyancy, gravity is the opposing force. So, buoyancy in a liquid, buoyancy is the force that's pushing up. Gravity is the force that's pushing down. Uh, if you don't have gravity, you don't have buoyancy. So his 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 argument makes no sense. Uh, according to what? Like well, what? What is what? Like I don't understand. What is the actual force that makes us go down? That makes my pen angry. go down. It's not. It's not. Doesn't need a force. It's what density. Is? It's. It's just. You can see the same thing. If you get. If you get a, a. Just a balloon with air. Yeah. Put it on water. It will stay on top of the water. Yeah, but yeah? there is a, a, an actual equation that can calculate the buoyancy of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> it doesn't need a force. It's just buoyancy. Um. Buoyancy is a force. Buoyancy is a counteracting force to gravity. So he has no idea what he's talking about, this guy. So this guy obviously has a clear disdain for science and for calculations, even though he tries to use them in a lot of his explanations. And this clip's quite quite a funny thing where he's he's basically trying to rib on calculations. That a less dense, dense object, something less dense than the air, will go up. Then you've got to also accept that something more dense than the air right, is so going to go because down. The right. Let me try to continue then. So it's more the air. The air is more dense on top, and then therefore it's less dense on bottom, and then that makes us go down. And then you can calculate 
like some sort of negative buoyancy or something? It's like it's how how it's le more simple than you your calculations. No, I'm, I'm yeah, <laughs> it's very simple. You know, if you if you fill, it's more simple than your calculations. Yeah, <laughs> that's oh my god. So he's just going off. So that essentially just says to me he's just coming up with some bullshit that has no meaning in anything, and it's just so simple that I can just make up any kind of bullshit. Use words that don't really I don't really know the meaning of. And it will supersede your... So it's quite funny trying to watch Pierre try and make sense of what he's actually saying and try and put it into logic and reason terms. So he's trying to say that the the air on top is uh, more dense and the air on the bottom is less dense, so we're creating some kind of negative buoyancy to try and put the bullshit that he's saying into some kind of sense. And then he turns it all around and says, no, 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 there's no calculations for this because I'm just talking complete bullshit. So... We don't need your calculations. I'm just going to talk a load of bullshit that's got no evidence, nothing supporting it. It's just something I've just made up out of thin air. That's what he's saying. And it's it's just calling for someone to call out. It's just like, you're just talking bullshit, mate. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Do you know anything? Well, not not really, because the, the difference is I grew up in the same model that Pierre lives yeah. in at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I understand, um, you know, I actually spent ages learning Einstein. Yeah, because I thought it was real. Yeah. Um, so I, I know the model that you're, you're living in. Yeah. No, you don't. Mate. <laughs> you can't understand the things that... Um, children are taught in school on physics you don't understand them it's clear from the things that you're saying that you don't understand them i'm sorry i don't mean to be mean but you have less understanding than what is taught to um 11 year olds in school so to then say that you have looked into einstein and that you understand einstein's equations is one of the most absurd statements i've ever heard like there is zero percent chance that you understand Einstein's equations. So, another thing that highlights this is this is this part. You know, you can you can you know paper it over with lots of calculations and mathematics, but fundamentally, it doesn't make sense. Our senses tell us what this Earth is. Yeah, it's so he's he's going on this basis of. He's throwing out all the calculations and he's just doing everything based on his senses. So, if you're throwing out all the calculations, how can you understand Einstein's model? Einstein's model is pure calculation. It's very, very high. Like, you need, you don't study that until you reach the upper levels of degrees. Even students that study Einstein's models, so physics students um, that take Einstein's modules in. Uh, undergraduate or even postgraduate level they still don't understand them fully people that study them directly that have way more backing and training than you uh, understand things to a much higher degree than you even they don't fully grasp them you don't fully grasp things that 11 year old children can fully grasp so it's like um, you're at the ability of someone that can crawl that hasn't quite learnt to walk yet and you're saying that you can run a marathon and not only are you saying that you can run a marathon you can run a marathon at world record pace and yet you can't even crawl so the things you're saying make no sense so now this is the part where this is the main part of the video where uh, which caused me to want to make my video I mean there's so many different parts in this video um, that I've tried to debunk, but none of these areas are my area of speci speciality. So, I'm a mathematician. Um, that's my area of speciality. So he then goes on to talk about acceleration and um, using our sensor to detect acceleration, and that how that's proof that the Earth isn't spinning and that we're not moving around the sun and that, that we're then not moving through a galaxy so so i'll just i'll let this play out 
yeah it's our eyes tell us it's a flat surface our senses tell us we're not moving yeah um, and before anyone says uh, you know uh, you should only ex uh, feel acceleration well when you're moving in a circle that's acceleration you're always constantly accelerating when you're moving in a circle that's acceleration so okay that acceleration is the rate of change of speed that's what acceleration is so let's say you're traveling at, let's say you're traveling at a constant speed of I don't know it could be anything it can be 10 miles an hour it can be 100 miles an hour it could be a hundred million miles an hour if that is constant throughout time then acceleration is zero like you're not accelerating it's the rate of change of speed through time it's the differential of speed. This thing about if you're going in a circle, you're accelerating, it doesn't make any sense. Rating in different directions. So you would feel it, yeah? Um, we don't feel it. We're being accelerated in, in several different directions all at once. So, yeah. Okay. The Earth's, um, the rotation of the Earth is accelerating. Um, and we can look that up so if you go on Google type in acceleration of earth spin the acceleration of earth spin yeah it does exist we are being accelerated in loads of different directions the acceleration is 0 0.0392 meters per second so we are accelerating um, but <clears throat> the reason we don't feel it is it's so minor that we can't possibly detect it with our sensors. We can use very highly tuned instruments to detect it, but our sensors aren't capable of detecting the acceleration of the Earth, even if it's in all these different directions. So the Earth's spin is probably the acceleration that's the most powerful. The rest of them are way, 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 way down the scale that there's even less chance. So we can do a very, very, very basic calculation, yeah, on this point. So we can imagine we're in a car. We start from standing, so we start from zero miles per hour. And what we do is we sl slowly accelerate up to 30 miles an hour in 10 seconds. So I'm gonna assume linear acceleration because acceleration is a curve, usually. Uh, it's, it's a rate of change, so you have time along the bottom, you have your speed, and then you see your speed slowly rise up. And the acceleration is the the gradient of this curve basically that's your acceleration it's very very basic calculus so dave has never studied any any physics and he has no understanding of rate of change and of calculus which is a fundamental principle of mathematics so okay so in this experiment we go from 0 to 30 miles an hour it takes us 10 seconds so what is our acceleration in meters per squared which is the same one that we're using here. What is our acceleration? It's 1.34 meters squared. So to calculate acceleration is very, very easy. You take your final velocity, you subtract your initial velocity, you divide it by your time. And obviously we're gonna do, we're gonna convert things um, so that we keep everything in meters per second. So you wanna do it in meters Per second as your speed and then you want to do it as seconds as your time to get meters per second squared so 1.34 meters per second squared so if you get in a car and you change your speed from 0 to 30 in 10 seconds you're gonna feel it if you close your eyes and someone does it and you put some plugs in your ears so you're not getting so you're not getting using your sight and your hearing you're just using your sense of acceleration so we do have a sense of acceleration, he's correct. So you control for all your other senses, you just have your sense of acceleration. If you, when you, You're going to feel the g-force very, very, very slightly. And so if you imagine that 1.34 meters per second is a very, very slight feeling of acceleration, what's 0 0.03 meters per second going to be? It's not it's not if you could divide that by 10 so it's a tenth and you're still at 0 0.13 you'll have to divide it by 
another factor of 10 to get anywhere near to the acceleration of the Earth. So a factor of 100. You could barely feel that acceleration in the car. How are you going to be able to detect a hundredth of that? You're not. You're not. It's going to feel like nothing to you. So this is a concept fundamentally that he doesn't understand. Um, so if I continue the video, you're going to see that Pierre tries to argue this to him and he just does not understand this concept. Yeah, except if this acceleration is really small and then you couldn't measure it, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, I don't know, a thousand miles an hour, um, rotation... Is so he talks about a thousand miles an hour, that's not acceleration, that's speed. So he's not talking about acceleration here. I don't know, a thousand miles an hour. The Earth, 67,000 miles an hour around the sun. 67,000 miles an hour around the sun. So he's quoting speed, values of speed. He's not quoting acceleration, so... 100,000 miles an hour being dragged along no, by the sun. No, those are big numbers, but when there's a big radius, that doesn't, you know, 400. So, Pierre's misunderstanding what he's trying to say here as well, but because I think, so, he's been bombarded by this, someone that is, is not being intellectually honest. He's, he's arguing from a dishonest view, like, platform. He's not being honest. He's throwing out conventional logic and he's using his own logic which where everything's untrue. And this has thrown Pierre off completely. He's probably never he's probably never interacted with someone that is this illogical and that has this little understanding of the basic principles of reality. So he's completely thrown off. So he he's and he looks really cold and he looks like he doesn't want to be there. So he's thrown off. So I can give him a pass for this. But it's so easy. The point that you can pick up on him like this is that you've just been quoting speed. You haven't quoted acceleration. If those speeds stay constant, then the acceleration doesn't change. How do you not understand that concept? 100,000 miles an hour. Yeah, no, I mean, this... this bigger like, than the radius yeah, of the Yeah, I mean, and, and yeah, the, yeah, is, you the know, speed is bigger than the radius 25 of the 25 atoms in this stuff. You know, this, these are big numbers, but that doesn't make it... That doesn't change the validity. Yeah, yeah, so his point is that you can have whatever speed you want. You could have a hundred billion trillion speed. If the acceleration is zero, you're not going to feel it. So it doesn't matter. He even said this at the point at the beginning. You can say about, and then he goes off on some tangent about some bullshit, which he was not talking about acceleration. Something, okay, right? so if, if, if a number is small, like if something is small or big, you know, that's <laughs> sort of irrelevant to like... So. Yeah, yeah, so he's saying it's irrelevant. He's right. He's saying it's irrelevant. Well, you what know what? If, if, um, if I'm sitting in a car and uh, that car moves off at like five miles an hour, I feel it. I, I feel that. So again, he's saying it moves off at five miles an hour, I feel it. I've just used the car example. He's using speed. He's quoting numbers in speed. If I move off at five miles per hour, that's not an acceleration uh, measure. That's speed. So it doesn't mean anything. Acceleration, five miles an hour. No, no two miles an hour. So I'd feel about, it. So you're talking about speed, right? Talking about <laughs> acceleration. Ooh, Sorry. Yeah. So, okay, so Pierre's picked up on the point now. Finally, he's. You're talking about speed. You're not talking about acceleration. I'm talking about acceleration. You're not. You're talking about speed, mate. It's like it's like talking to a child that just does not want to understand. Excuse me. I you're talking. Uh, you're talking about speed, but that's different from acceleration, right? The the thing no, that no, you will really find is going from. No, no, I'm talking about acceleration. Five miles an hour. Five miles an hour of acceleration. If I go in a car at five miles an hour, if the Earth is going at sixty-five million billion miles an hour, that's acceleration. No, no, that's 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 speed. Uh, acceleration is in. Um, is a rate of change of speed. Uh, it doesn't actually matter what the speed is for acceleration. From zero to five miles per hour, right? That's acceleration. Moving around in a circle is acceleration. Moving around in a circle is acceleration. No, no, acceleration is a rate of change of speed. Circles have nothing to do with acceleration. I mean, you could you could go around a circle in a constant speed and your acceleration is zero. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Like, uh, 
Yeah, moving at constant speed, you know, in a straight line is not acceleration. But yeah. moving yeah. at constant speed in a circle yeah, yeah, is you, acceleration. Yeah, moving at co is acceleration. So he's talking about centrifugal force and centripetal force here. Um, he's not talking about acceleration. So he's going off on a complete tangent here. He's he's linking things together that shouldn't be linked. So yes, acceleration. Yeah, I'm telling you that we're moving supposedly in this model in several different um, directions. You know, at once, accelerating in all all of these directions, and we don't feel it. You know, we can have a, a lake that's perfectly still. <laughs> You know, you can drop a feather and it goes it lightly goes straight down. You know, while we're being hurtled in several different directions at once. Yeah, but the acceleration is negligible. Like you can pull up the acceleration of all these different things that you're talking about, and it's numbers that you probably don't even know what they mean. So okay, so I'm going to look up acceleration of Earth around Sun. Okay, so this is the acceleration of the Earth around the Sun. It's it's another order of magnitude down. So the fact that we're accelerating in all these different directions, all the the bigger the numbers that you're quoting, basically the less an effect it has. So no, you know it. So this model doesn't match our senses. Yes, it does. It does match our senses perfectly. <laughs> okay. Anything well, I, like that before we uh, sort of wrap up? Yeah, well, ac <laughs> sorry. Um, so he's freezing. <laughs> what I'm trying to say here is is really, he's really like, struggling. Th there is right acceleration, you know, all this. Whether it's uh, you know, th this is sort of connects towards to the to the actual fact that the Earth is round or not, right? This, the fact that we don't feel the acceleration, one explanation could be, and in this case is, that the acceleration is too small at the point where we're trying to measure it, right? We can do that, right? Like, if I, uh, I'm in a car and I have a, whatever, something like an uh, accelerometer. Yeah, so I feel really sorry for Pierre. He's, he's going on to explain these points, um, but he's just... He gives too much credence to what Dave has to say. Because Dave's just talking absolute bullshit. Everything he says is just complete bullshit. So he's made the point that, yeah, he's made the very valid point, which is the same point that I've made, in that the acceleration is too small that we don't feel it. That should that should answer the his concerns. He'll go on to some claim about well, no, because acceleration, is constant speed in a circle is acceleration. We're being hurtled in all these different directions. And you're like, what? You've, you, no, 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 no. You're using circular logic and your logic's not making any sense. So that's essentially the, the video. Um, I thought, as I said at the beginning, I thought it'd be good to kind of make a response on this video because... I feel really sorry for Pierre and I feel like he was kind of a lot of these topics aren't his area of expertise he's obviously very knowledgeable about all of these topics um, he does put up some good defensive answers um, but he wasn't prepared at all for the level of ignorance and the just complete misunderstanding that Dave is going to put across and Dave is a lot better at talking than Pierre um, so it looks like he has the edge. He talks from a much more confident uh, platform of authority, even though the things that he's saying are complete rubbish. So an example of Dave's argument is something like, um, well, the theory that um, the sea is blue is wrong. It's clearly wrong. You can go outside, you can look at the sea on, like some days and the sea is grey or the sea is green so the theory that the sea is blue is just wrong like it's just wrong and because he's talking like with such conviction and he's a good like he's a good public speaker you'll be like yes actually hang on a minute 
sometimes the sea isn't blue the sea's red so our whole model of seas is wrong and obviously it's complete bullshit like obviously we know why uh, the color of the sea changes but that's just an example you can pick anything that you want you can pick anything and turn it into a load of bullshit and that's all it's like most flat earthers are worse at it than this guy this guy's quite good at doing that um, but yeah that's all it is basically I thought I'd make a response video to this podcast because I don't think they uh, justified the the criticism well enough really uh, so that's it thanks for watching